we want to welcome you to a very, very special hangout. My name is Leo Laporte, and I am thrilled, uh, and I'm sure you will be too, for the opportunity to talk to uh, Vince Cerf. He's often called one of the fathers of the Internet. In the early 70s, he and Robert Kahn designed the fundamental protocol that powers the Internet to this day, TCP IP. He helped found and was a longtime chair of ICANN. That's the global body that manages the Internet domain system. Mr. Cerf is currently Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google, and we're very pleased to welcome Vince Cerf to this Hangout. Welcome, Vince. Thanks so much, Leo. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today and with all the others who are joining us. It's very nice to see you. Yeah, and it, we do want to welcome the thousands of people all over the world who are joining us on this uh, Google Plus uh, Hangout. Many of you are already sending questions uh, via the website, google.com slash takeaction. Uh, we also are using that live Q&A tool. So if you're watching uh, live, you'll see that on the right side of your screen. We'll take questions from there. We have about a half an hour with uh, Mr. Surf today. Um, and I'm not going to even ask you any questions. We have so many great questions from our audience all around the world, except I have to say one thing, because you told me before we began. Uh, you're in Washington, D.C. right now. That's correct. And where are you? I am physically at a place called 20th and M Street, incredibly on the third floor, incredibly in the office suite where I designed and built MCI Mail, starting in 1983, actually late 82. Uh, and I was here for four years before I returned to research uh, with Bob Kahn. So this is literally a closure of, God, how many, 30 plus years, 31 years to be back on this floor. It's amazing. It's, I think people today don't understand that in the early days of electronic mail, there was no kind of global system. There were differing systems. I remember having an MCI mail account, and you could only e email other MCI mail account holders. That's until at, 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 at the beginning. Well, actually, we had CompuServe hooked up uh, with right. MCI mail. But by 1988, we managed to get permission to hook MCI mail up to the Internet. And everybody else with their email services, like Telemail and OnTime, said, well, wait, we want to be part of this, too. And they all got hooked up. And then they realized, holy moly, all of our users can talk to all of the users of our competitors. What have we done? <laughs> and of course, it, it, and eventually, um, commercial for pay email kind of evaporated because free it was hard to compete with free. Let me uh, start with a question from Praveen Sharma. She's from Gurgaon, uh, India, and uh, asked, "As the father of the internet, you must be in love with its contribution uh, towards humanity. It made the impossible possible by connecting the whole world through one single network. But what is the one thing that you fear most?" about its future. Uh, this is, first of all, thank you for the, uh, the compliments. The thing I worry the most about is that somehow in the politicization of issues related to internet that we will lose its openness, that we will lose the permissionless innovation which has driven so much uh, value in the internet, not only in the uh, sense of uh, corporate values but also in the sense of values to you and me, applications that have been invented uh, on the network that could never have been, uh, you know, propagated if it weren't for the fact that basically all you had to do was to put your idea up on the net, get access to the net, put an application on and let people get access to it. Larry and Sergey, when they started Google, did not have to get permission of every internet service provider in the entire world in order to bring that service up. And we should work very hard to make sure the internet continues to support that kind of openness and freedom. Uh, Ayaz Ahmad Ahmad Khan of Punjab, Pakistan says, what can people like me living in places like Pakistan do to achieve a, a, this free and open web? Well, this is a, a hard thing to do, especially if you happen to live in a country which is um, committed to limiting people's access to the net or limiting their freedom of access to information or their freedom to share information with others. Uh, I think that uh, you have some technical means for somehow uh, escaping the confines of the country uh, by using virtual private networks and things of that sort. But perhaps more important, uh, in order to achieve a kind of lasting outcome, uh, you may have to take some risk and, in fact, uh, lobby for, to use an American term, uh, more openness on the grounds that it's actually better for the country and its population. The more open the network can be, the more opportunity there uh, will be for businesses in country to reach other possible markets outside. And every country in the world has the following equation. Your domestic market is smaller than the rest of the world's market. 
And what you don't want to do is establish policies that inhibit the ability of uh, companies in country or other service providers in country to reach other possible markets. That's the, where the real benefit of a fully interconnected and open network comes from. And that kind of uh, raises the issue that's been on people's minds, and there's been a lot of talk about uh, lately, uh, the future of ICANN. You're one of the founders uh, of ICANN, longtime chair. It is the uh, non-governmental international group responsible for the management of the domain name system, which obviously is critical to all of the Internet. Um, and uh, until recently, the U.S. Department of Congress kind of, uh, co sorry, of Commerce kind of uh, oversaw that. But it, there's a change happening. What's going on, and is this risky? I think there's some who think we're we're kind of giving up control of the U.S. is giving up of control of the internet, and fear that other nations might want to take control. <clears throat> so first of all, control is a very odd term to use here. Uh, in in simple terms. The National Telecommunication and Information Agency, which is part of the Department of Commerce, has a contract with ICANN. It has had that contract since 1998. The contract says ICANN will uh, administer the top-level domains of the domain name system. Not the rest of it, but the top-level domains. Uh, it will also uh, allocate in big blocks internet address space, numerical addresses, to internet service providers by way of what are called regional internet registries. This is so that you and I, when we get access to the internet from our local internet service provider, will also get address space that we need for our laptops, desktops, mobiles, and tablets, and so on. And finally, uh, this same contract uh, to ICANN provides for uh, ICANN's um, administration of tables of uh, parameters that are associated with the Internet protocols. And we do this, or they do this, on behalf of the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is uh, housed in the Internet Society and which makes the standards for the Internet. So these three functions are the things that ICANN performs under that contract. The uh, NTIA um, staff reviews changes to the root zone, that's the, the file that points to all the top-level domains of the internet, .com, .net, .fr, .in, .cn, and so on. Uh, there is a, a file that helps your software figure out how to get to www.google.com, for example, or www.internetsociety.org. Uh, that root zone file is propagated around the world uh, from ICANN by way of uh, some help of, of another company called VeriSign, which is also in the general uh, Washington, D.C. area. The uh, NTIA folks uh, monitor the changes that are being made or proposed to be made to that root zone file, and that's all they do. So control is a very, very, uh, too much of an overstatement. What they do is provide uh, oversight and accountability for the changes made to that root zone. The proposal that was made on the 14th of March by NTIA was to release to ICANN and the Internet community the responsibility for that oversight, for that accountability. And they've asked for a proposal coming from the Internet community by way of processes that ICANN uh, is initiating to come up with a plan that will assure that the Internet will stay open, that the uh, freedom of expression can be maintained, and that uh, the accountability for actions taken with regard to these responsibilities uh, will be um, assured by some multi-stakeholder process. And I finally, I'm sorry this is such a long answer, but it's, uh, it's a complex topic. Multi-stakeholder in this case refers to the private sector, it refers to the technical community, it refers to civil society, like you and me as users, and it refers to governments. So the multi-stakeholder notion says all of these parties should have a role to play in setting policy and assuring accountability. And although speaking only for myself, I believe that it is possible for this contractual relationship to be terminated and for ICANN to institute practices, many of which it already has in place, to assure that the multi-stakeholder community has adequate uh, transparency and ability to uh, assure accountability of actions taken by ICANN so, and or any of the other agencies that ICANN feeds information to. So I believe this is actually an opportunity to demonstrate to the world that the multi-stakeholder model really works. And, and you feel it's doable. I think there's some concern, maybe it's only in the U.S., that 
other countries would like to control. The, <laughs> there's that word again that you don't like. Yeah. But control uh, the internet. Uh, well, in fact, I agree with the uh, concern that countries do want to control the internet. The question is whether they would get any useful control by way of this apparatus that currently exists. The answer is no, they wouldn't. Uh, what countries do if they want to prevent people in country from making use of the internet freely and openly is to interfere with its underlying um, uh, implementation in country. The thing that they can't that's do... That's what's is happening in Turkey, for instance. Yeah, so it's happening in Turkey, it's happening in Pakistan, it's happening in Russia and China and so on. Those countries have the ability to go in and to force their internet service providers to behave in certain ways, to modify the tables that they're using, and they have a direct impact on the people using the system in country, but what they can't do is force their ideas and their preferences on anyone else. There are technical means of inhibiting that, and there are ideas that are uh, in consideration to make it even harder for them to try to reach out and have extraterritorial impact on the rest of us. And I think this has to be understood by people who are worried about this and believe that the multi-stakeholder uh, mechanism for assuring accountability uh, could be uh, somehow coerced by a country to harm everyone else. And the answer is no, there isn't any way for them to do that. And there are technical means of inhibiting that even better than we do now, and those are in fact under development. That leads us to Fleming uh, Dahl Jorgensen's uh, question via our Hangout. Uh, is the Internet, in your view, a human right? So I had written an editorial claiming that it wasn't, and um, I got quite a bit of feedback. Uh, let me, and then I wrote a follow-up. Let me say the following. I'm nervous about declaring that a particular technology is a human right, and the reason I'm nervous about it is that the technology could change. It could, there could be better technology coming along, and it feels very funny to say, this is a human right, and then all of a sudden it isn't anymore because there's something else that replaced it. However, I will say that freedom of speech, access to information, the ability to hear is absolutely fundamental. There's no question about that. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights enshrines that notion. Internet it, it certainly supports that um, freedom. And I think it's fair to say that if you had access to the Internet and you were denied access to it, your rights have been violated. I completely agree with that. Uh, but I do believe that, you know, 50 years or 100 years from now, something better than the Internet will come along, and if I were alive then, I would be cheer that because I want things to get better. Yeah, so in fact, that's what the United Nations report said uh, a few years ago, that, the, that disconnecting people from the Internet is a human rights violation. That's a different thing than saying that it is uh, a human right. Um, well, if, I, if you don't mind my uh, uh, small codicil, one problem with declaring something a human right is the question is how do you act on that? How do you provide that service? And it's clear that it's a, it's, it's, there's a cost associated with that. And we can't absolutely guarantee that everyone will have access. Personally, I would love it for everybody in the world to have access to the Internet. That's why I'm the chief Internet evangelist at Google. <laughs> It's a good thing. <laughs> well, it, it has changed the world uh, politically, uh, in education, in every sphere of our life. In education, it has changed the world. Um, which leads me to uh, this question from Tristan Copley Smith: If the internet should become compromised, I mean, we see, a, I guess, a challenge to net neutrality by commercial interests. Would you support the creation of and the migration to a new network of uh, that is somehow uncompromised? Well, first of all, I'm absolutely committed to the notion that the Internet should say open and neutral in the sense that the parties that are operating it can't use their portion of the operation to inhibit others from getting access to information that they seek or from providing information or services that they want to make available. So a lot of the net neutrality debate is, um, is couched in uh, terms of, you know, all packets are treat, uh, treated equally or uh, you're not allowed to charge more for more usage, none of which is true. Those are misrepresentations mm -hmm. by people who don't wish to be told uh, that you can't abuse your control of a broadband channel to inhibit other people from providing service to the people that you are connecting to the Internet. So this is really an issue about uh, uh, anti-competitive behaviors more than anything else. Uh, and to come back to the specific question, if something better comes along, which is better able to assure users have access to the net, 
can go where they want to go, can uh, run the applications that they want to run, and if the existing internet at the time doesn't permit that, I'd be the first guy to say, move over to something that's better. It's interesting, both in this question of uh, governmental interference in the internet and now of commercial interference in the internet, it sounds like what you're saying is that in the extremities of the net, whether it's a nation or a, a broadband, a base of broadband customers, the internet can be thwarted, but the, ultimately the fundamental central network cannot. Is that is that a fair statement of what I, you said? I think that's fair. Uh, central is a very funny word to use here because it's highly, uh, you know, very decentralized, very uh, widely uh, well connected system. Uh, but it's correct to say that at the edges of the net, where there's kind of a geographical confinement, it's possible uh, to interfere with users' access. And this is why we have to be very thoughtful about assuring uh, legislative and legal postures that will protect users' interests in their freedom of expression and freedom of access to information. A yeah. um, number of people, including Matthew Beck of York Haven, uh, Pennsylvania, and um, uh, Donita Prakash of Ashburn, Virginia, asked about Edward Snowden. They wanted to know What's your take on Edward Snowden, uh, his revelations about NSA spying? Is he a hero? Is he a villain? Or somewhere in between? So this is, um, I have to admit to you, on alternate Tuesdays, I go back and forth on this. <laughs> uh, I think that, that Edward Snowden took an oath to protect the information that he released. And so that disturbs me a lot. And I think there was a big price to pay uh, in the release of that information in terms of compromising uh, American and other intelligence uh, service abilities to perform their uh, their jobs, which is in a sense to protect uh, the population from potential uh, harm. On the other hand, I think that uh, it's certainly speaking just about the American population, uh, I don't believe that we had an opportunity as a population, as a, as a society, to debate the, um, the wisdom of what was being done before it was underway. And we all understand that the origins of this were 9-11. It was a dramatic and traumatic experience, and many things happened you know, in, the, in the heat of all that. But this has continued now for nearly a decade and a half. Uh, this, this discussion that we have been having on the subject is very important for, especially for de democratic societies, ours included. So I'm glad that the discussion is happening. I'm glad that real uh, issues are being raised about the scope uh, and extent of the programs that uh, have been um, undertaken by NSA and others. But I wish that we had had this conversation in a different way, and I wish that we had paid a lower price for that conversation than we already have. And we and the price that is being paid is uh, uh, multivarious, including uh, companies like Google. Uh, and the lack of trust of United States companies around the world now. In fact, I, th I would imagine that part of the pressure to uh, give up the ICANN contract on the part of the U.S. Department of Commerce comes from this, these NSA revelations. So uh, I don't know for sure whether that's correct, but it's not an unreasonable supposition. Uh, and you're quite right that trust in American companies eroded fairly um, visibly uh, as a consequence of fear that uh, any company that was providing Internet-based services was somehow also compromised. I, I will say that Google's reaction to this specifically was to start encrypting everything that goes between the data centers of our backbone network and also encrypting things as they land on the disk drives of those data centers so that they're encrypted at rest as well as encrypted in transit. For some years now, we have been encrypting traffic going from the users' laptops, desktops, and tablets to our services. So we've in increased the amount of protection uh, throughout the system in response to these revelations. Uh, on a lighter note, a question from uh, Joaquin Aparicio in San Salvador, El Salvador. What do you see for the future of the Internet of Things? So I'm quite excited about this, although there are some big challenges ahead. There may be literally billions of devices, you know, light bulbs that, like Philips uh, makes a light bulb called Hue. It's Love controllable it. from your mobile, and it, you change the color as well as the intensity of the light. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Of course, only a geek would love that right now, and they're fairly, fairly expensive, but, you know, I think it's a very good example of what's possible. So the thing I like about it is that we may be able to manage quite a wide range of appliances that surround us every day at home, in the office, at work, in the car. 
maybe also things that we are wearing or things that we actually might even have embedded in our body, sensors that are helping us track uh, our uh, vital signs and our, our health status. Uh, at the same time, however, while this, this opens up wonderful and interesting opportunities, as long as we have standards uh, for interoperability and new services and products, the one thing that we should be very worried about is that the software which manages all this stuff uh, may be penetrated or compromised in some way. And so the, you know, the scenario might be, uh, you know, the Bank of, uh, of America succumbs to a denial of service attack from 100 million refrigerators in the United States. <laughs> and, and, you know, when you, you, we think that sounds funny, and, you know, I use that. I do it. I, it's a deliberate laugh line, right? Except for one thing. It's true. The, it's a time it's, well, service, the, yeah, right? yeah, the processing power that's available for making these things accessible is enough that if it were, in fact, penetrated in some, you know, nefarious program installed, uh, it could be quite damaging. So we have to think very hard about access control. We have to think about strong authentication so that these devices are not controlled by anything other than what you want them to be controlled by. We want to control where the information they have goes because we don't want privacy to be uh, harmed by having a lot of these devices aware of whether somebody's home or not at home or how many people are at home or what rooms are you in. So uh, to say nothing of configuring literally billions of devices. So. Uh, the computer science community has a real challenge to meet here. Uh, and in fact, I just met with a group uh, that's part of the uh, Computer Research Association, made up of all the uh, uh, heads of the computer science departments in the United States, this morning to talk about exactly those challenges and what we need to do in the curriculum in order to prepare our software people for building a system that's actually safe to use. You know, I, I'm sure when you designed uh, or helped design TCPIP with with Bob Kahn, uh, there was, and I, I get the sense of this uh, from all of the, the fathers and mothers of the internet that there was this kind of openness, this feeling that let's create an open, free uh, network. But of course, uh, security's become more and more of an issue. I don't want to say because of that, but uh, I guess we're we're a little more cynical now than we were uh, then. If you, R.J. Warren in our uh, Hangout asks, if you had to redesign TCP/IP today, what changes would you make? Uh, well, the first thing I would do is use IP version six with 128-bit address <laughs> space, so we don't have to go through this really painful process of getting v6 installed in in parallel with v4. By the way, I can ask everybody who's on the Hangout. Please ask your internet service providers what their plan and schedule is for getting IPv6 running. And please you, demand this because a lot of them are saying, well, the users aren't asking for this, and I want you to ask for that so they get the message. So that's point number one. The second thing that if we had had in our hands the kinds of uh, cryptographic technology that we have today, I would absolutely would have used it. Um, in fact, during the mid-1970s, while I was still at Stanford and working on this, I also worked with the National Security Agency on the design of a secured version of the internet, but we used classified crypto technology at the time, and I couldn't share that with my colleagues, and so I was schizophrenic for quite some time about that. Finally, uh, the thing which is really uh, ironic is that on the Stanford campus in 1977, two of my colleagues, uh, Marty Hellman and Whitfield Diffie, invented public key cryptography and published a paper on the subject, but they didn't have any algorithms for doing it. This was a speculative uh, sort of mathematical observation about if you had functions that did this, you could make a security system work this way with public keys. And it wasn't until later that we got RSA, for example. But in today's world, we can apply these things. We do apply them, and there are more ways to use them than have even been <coughs> implemented. So if I could start over again, I would have introduced a lot more strong authentication and cryptography into the system. I will say one other thing. When the original design was done, we didn't have the notion of firewall. We assumed, or at least I assumed, that every host had to defend itself. It had to assume that everybody else might be hostile and that if a packet showed up, it had to be suspicious of where did this come from and why are they talking to me? And if I don't recognize them, I will reject the traffic and won't pay attention. Uh, when businesses came along, I think some of them said, well, we have all these assets that are part of our network, and we're not prepared to go and ironclad every single computer in our company to protect themselves against this possible risk. 
So let's build perimeter firewalls that will somehow protect all the assets inside. This is a typical kind of military-like uh, thinking. The trouble with it, the idea is that it doesn't work very well. If somebody walks around the firewall of an infected memory stick, sticks it into the computer, and infects, infects things from the inside, which has happened. So I think, although we still are going to use firewalls and the like, I think we are also going to have to build much more paranoid operating systems that will resist various kinds of attacks. I've been trying to get the Android guys to rename their operating system Paranoid, but the marketing <laughs> guys think that's not a good idea. Maybe, maybe they change your tune today. <laughs> well, you raised IPv6, and you've been, uh, you know, the Paul Revere uh, saying, you know, that we're going to run out of Internet addresses for a long time now, maybe seven or eight years. When you Actually, design, how about 18 years since eight, 1996? But at the time, you, uh, when you were working on TCP IP, I presume the dotted quad came from that, the, the, the number of addresses IPv4 came from that. Yes, um, it did. did you just think we wouldn't need more addresses? Uh, well, here's the story. First of all, Bob and I had just finished working on the ARPANET, the predecessor to the Internet, which had grown very, very quickly uh, to not only cover a number of uh, places in the United States, but also Europe, uh, some sites in Europe as well. But it was a non-trivial exercise to build a national scale network. So as we were thinking about the Internet and thinking, well, this is going to be some arbitrary number of networks all interconnected. We don't know how many and we don't know how they'll be connected. But national scale networks, we thought, well, maybe there will be two per country because it was expensive, right? So uh, and at this point, Ethernet had, not, had been invented, but it wasn't you know, proliferating everywhere as it did do a few years later. So um, then we said, how many countries are there? We did two, two networks per country. How many networks? And we didn't have Google to ask, so we guessed at 128. Uh, yeah. and, and that's, you know, that would be two times 128 is 256 networks. That's eight bits. And then we said, how many computers will there be on each network? And we said, how about 16 million? That's another 24 bits. So we had a 32-bit address, which allowed 4.3 billion terminations, which I thought in 1974 or 3 was enough to do the experiment. And I honestly thought that if it worked, if the Internet idea actually worked, that we would then build a production version of it. Oh. And, and what happened is that it got loose into, into use. And, the, you know, we've been using the experimental Internet design since 1983 when we turned it on. So in 2012, we turned on IPv6 in everywhere where it was capable of being run. That's the production Internet. Oh, so, you know, get your V6 in place so you can run the 21st century version of the Internet. You've been running on the development server all this time. Yeah. So uh, I think one thing that made it less of an issue, even uh, since you uh, started calling for this change, was a NAT, network address translation, that allowed multiple computers to use a single Internet address. And a lot of carriers are addressing IPv6 by doing carrier uh, NAT. Car carrier grade NATs, yes. Uh, is that a, a stopgap, or is, or is that an acceptable solution from your point it's of view? A bad, it's a bad solution, in my view, for many reasons. The first one is that when you start cascading NATs on, you know, one after the other, it becomes a very brittle, very difficult system to debug. But the second thing about NATs that is not very nice is that you can't bring up servers at the edges of the net with a carrier grade NAT. And you, you can sort of do it, but it's very clumsy and you need protocols like stun, turn, and everything else to figure out what's my visible IP address because I can't tell from inside because I'm using these private uh, networks whose addresses are not unique. V6 eliminates all that because it, it makes it possible to identify the edge device by an address that's uniquely and globally addressable. And some people will say, but that opens up, you know, possible attack. And the answer is, you can attack people whether you're using carrier grade NAT or not. But once you're visible on the net, people can send packets at you. Uh, so that's not a protection. The ideal protection, again, is that you put firewalls in front of the IPv6 devices and you allow things in or you let the device decide whether or not it will accept traffic. Uh, in order to uh, carry out a transaction, but at least it gives you the possibility of having servers anywhere in the network, not just in the core tier one large scale networks. I'm going to move on to some lighter questions. You have a few more minutes spent. I do indeed. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you're the father of the internet, I have to get the person who asked this because I don't want to take responsibility. Dave Dulock in Andover, Minnesota. Who's the mother? 
<laughs> so that's a very good question, and more than one person has asked that. I, I, you know, the, yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's uh, Bob Kahn and I were married at the time. So no, no, Bob wasn't <laughs> married at the time. So I was. So maybe it's my wife, Sigrid. I don't know. I'll tell you something though. On September 10th, Bob Kahn of uh, 1973, Bob Kahn and I uh, described the design of the internet to an international team at the University of Sussex in England on September 10th. My first son was born on September 6th, 1973, so he's asking whether he's the brother of the Internet. <laughs> Anybody related to the Internet, that's good. That's a good, <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, uh, Tori uh, Namaser, I'm not sure where Tori's from, asks, and you're very famous for your three-piece suits, why do you dress so sharply in an industry where dressing down is the norm? Yeah, so uh, there's actually a real story behind this. Uh, I was at Stanford University uh, from, from 1972 to 76 on the faculty. Uh, historically, I tended to wear uh, ties and you know, sports coat and slacks. I did that all the way back in high school as well because I just didn't want to look like everybody else. And uh, that was an easy way of just looking different. But uh, when um, I told my wife that we were being asked to move to Washington, D.C., she said, Washington, D.C., three-piece suits. So she immediately went out to Saks Fifth Avenue, bought three three-piece suits. Now, we moved there in August of 1976. Summertime in Washington sucks big time, hot, muggy, and everything else. So I had seersucker, at least one or two seersucker three-piece suits. Very sharp. So, so early on in my time at ARPA, um, I was had to do a, a, some testimony before some committee. And so, uh, in the in the middle of all this, I wore my three-piece seersucker suit, went and did my testimony, and came back. And then a, a couple of weeks later, I was called into the director's office, and uh, he said, um, "I heard back from the committee about your testimony." And I'm thinking, "Uh oh, you know, geez, did I say something wrong?" And uh, he said, "They were very happy with your testimony. And by the way, they said you were the best, sharpest dresser they've ever seen from ARPA." And that positive reinforcement has led me to wear nothing but three-piece suits for the last 38 years. You, you look good. Uh, another one from uh, our hangout from Lasana Murray, uh, VI or Emacs? Oh, that, how, yes, those were ancient uh, editing systems. Uh, actually, none, none of the above. I was a Tico user. Oh, my on, goodness. Uh, on 10X. Yeah. And when I wasn't when I wasn't using Doug Engelbart's system NLS, which was sort of a World Wide Web in a box uh, in the late uh, in late early, early you know mid 60s mid to late 1960s. In fact, if if you want to see the mother of all demos, just type mother of all demos to Google, and you will see a 1968 demonstration by Doug Engelbart of the mouse, uh, of the five fingered keyboard, a foot treadle. And hyperlinking and an incredible editing system. Truly. Yeah, it is. It is truly an amazing thing. But that's not the system you used. Uh, actually, eventually it was because that was available on the ARPANET. So I used I used Tico when I was running on 10x machines. But when I had access to Doug Engelbart's system through the ARPANET, I made use of NLS. Wow, you didn't use a cording keyboard though. Uh, yes, I did. Oh, this is the, uh, and the, yeah, I had the five-finger keyboard for binary commands and uh, had the mouse so that you didn't have to keep moving your hands back and forth. You would never type, but for right. just for commands and moving chunks of text around, that, that worked very well. There was a foot treadle, too. And when you push the foot treadle down, uh, it didn't make the machine run faster. What it did was to make all the blank spaces uh, visible so you could see whether it was a tab or a carriage return or some other uh, otherwise uh, empty space character. I have to ask you, and, I, and I, this is a, you probably hear this question a lot, but it, it always interests me when you, when you look back at what the, at the man you were, the people you worked with 30, 40 years ago, creating this. Did you have a sense of what m the potential, what might happen when when the internet uh, went into version 1.0, or were you just solving a scientific problem, an engineering problem? Um, I I think it's fair to say. I mean, the trivial answer, of course, would be to say no, but it wouldn't be true. Uh, we were focused very much on the specific problem of how do we get multiple packet switch nets to interact with each other in a transparent way because we wanted the Defense Department to have that as a, as a uh, potential uh, you know, arrow in their quiver. 
Uh, we knew that we had to get it to work on mobile vehicles, on aircraft, ships at sea, and fixed installations. And that meant we needed radio and satellite. So Bob Kahn and I worked very hard on this multi-network design for that purpose. However, uh, I think it's important to recognize that we started that work in the spring of 1973. By that time, electronic mail, networked electronic mail, had now become very popular on the ARPANET, thanks to Ray Tomlinson and others. And it, it was instantly apparent that this was a social medium. And the reason I think I can say this is that uh, within what seemed like weeks of the um, arrival of networked electronic mail, mailing lists popped up. Mm -hmm. And the first one that I know about or remember is called Sci-Fi Lovers. These are, this is a discussion list about science fiction. Of course, we're all geeks and we all read science fiction stuff. So that made sense. And then the next one that came out of Stanford, if I remember right, was called Yum Yum. And it was a restaurant review distribution list for restaurants in the Palo Alto area. So it was very clear very early on that there was a strong social element to the way in which this communication system worked. And I think you'll find many of my colleagues uh, who will say that, that as time went on, it was increasingly clear that this was not just a system for connecting computers together, but it was a system for connecting people to each other to allow them to collaborate, to exchange information, uh, to work together, uh, and also to help uh, that collaboration over multiple time zones. And so there was very clearly a, um, a social element of all this. And so much of what's happened is not surprising. And in some cases, one wonders why did it take so long. Yeah, I very vividly remember uh, using the well in the early 90s. And then you could drop out of the well shell onto a text-based internet using Gopher and Archie. And even yes. then, it felt like, wow, the whole world is available is here. So, so you mentioned Gopher. I just have to tell you, if we have a minute, uh, the Internet Society gets started. It's announced in mid-1991. We started in January of 1992. I'm the sitting president of the Internet Society. Uh, the World Wide Web stuff that Tim Berners-Lee was doing is not visible yet. He's done it, but, but it's not widely visible. Uh, and so as I'm sitting down, I get an email request uh, from somebody uh, in Slovenia who says, uh, I would like to do something about the American claims on the .si top-level domain. And uh, he said that he's very upset that the Americans have set aside .si for the Spratly Islands. <laughs> okay, so my first, first reaction is, what the hell are the Spratly Islands and why did we care? And I didn't know the answer to that, so I sort of set this question aside. The next message is from somebody who has just introduced Gopher, and he says, you should go try, you know, this uh, you know, Gopher service. So I go to the Gopher service, and you remember that it was, it was text and numbers, and you would type a number in to say which uh, command you wanted to execute or which line you wanted to use. And so I'm stepping through this, looking at online material, and the first thing I come across is the CIA World Factbook, and I'm just... I'm boggling, thinking, oh my God, we're all going to go to jail. Somebody put up this top secret thing on the ARPANET, we're going to be dead, and, or on the internet. And so um, then I discovered it was publicly uh, available, unclassified, and everything else. And so at this point, I thought, oh, wait a minute. If anybody knows about the Spratly Islands, it would be the CIA. So I went to the CIA World Factbook, looked up the Spratly Islands, and discovered that they were an uninhabited set of islands out in the middle of you know, the South China Seas, and uh, they had airfields and you know, unpopulated and in large quantities of bat guano. I thought, well, maybe that's why we're interested in it. You know, bat guano is really great for farming and fertilizer. So I then thought, okay, so now I have to go get a hold of the uh, somebody at the State Department at the Spratly Islands desk. So I'm beginning the process of trying to figure out how to maneuver my way into the State Department. And in the midst of all this, something happened. I don't quite know what, but I got another email from the guy in Slovenia saying .si had been released and the Slovenians are using it. Thank you very much. And I thought, well, I don't know what happened, but I get blamed for a lot of stuff, so I sent a note back saying, well, you're very welcome. I'm glad I could be of service. To this day, I have no idea why it was we released the Spratly Islands.si thing, but there you are. Did you ever hear from anybody at the Spratly Islands? Or no. No, it's uninhabited. Nobody's there. It's the a, birds. That's uh, nobody's there. Just the birds. That's right. <laughs> or bats. Actually, just the bats. You said you're a, a fan of science fiction, and I'm sure you've seen The Matrix. 
Uh, perhaps yes. you've heard that the architect, the artificial intelligence that make chains the matrix, and in fact, if you've seen the movie, looks just like you, wears a gray suit just like the one you're wearing, and it is widely believed to be modeled on you. Was that a? Did you feel that was a praise or? <laughs> well, first of all, I didn't realize this until somebody drew my attention to it. I'd seen the first Matrix movie, but I hadn't seen the second one, which is where that uh, character shows up. Uh, at one point in a conference, uh, one of the presenters put that picture up next to mine and asked the question, are you the architect? And my response was, what makes you think you're not in the Matrix? Oh, the perfect question for a fan of sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> we have no evidence or proof, I'm afraid. We just have to hope. <laughs> do you think we are in a construct? Uh, you know, sometimes you do wonder a little bit about that. Um, I don't know the answer. I'm reading David Brin's Kiln People right now, yes. which is, you know, it's not quite the same, but it's very similar. Daniel Gallu who wrote a book called Similicron 3, which is what I believe The Matrix was based on, uh, because it had that plot line of being down in a simulated environment, and one of the simulated characters realizes he can push himself up into the next universe, so to speak, the one that you know, we would consider the real one. So who knows? I guess one last uh, question for Vince Cerf, and I want to thank you for taking the time and, and doing this Google Hangout with us, and thanks uh, to all the people all over the world who've been watching. Uh, it's been really a, a great uh, pleasure. Uh, this is this was created by the the Take Action folks at Google, which is their uh, their action page where uh, you know we we hope to all fight for the preservation of a free and open internet. Do you, do you have advice for uh, all of us? Things that we should do to to make sure that that thing that we, we hold so dear uh, is preserved? So I think that the, yes, first of all, I think there are things that we can all do. And I, I think it's important to recognize that we all live in different parts of the world. Our access to the internet varies. Uh, the regimes in which we live will vary in their attitudes about openness or, or not. Uh, and so I think several things can happen. One, we should be looking for technologies that will preserve access to the open internet, even in places where uh, there are attempts to shut it down. I think that we want to argue strongly that the benefits of openness are important to every country in the world, even though there are some regimes that are fearful of people's free exchange of information. But the economic value of an open, uh, free internet is so powerful and, in my view, so compelling uh, that we should all be repeatedly articulating that the value of the network comes from what we put into it and what we get out of it, and that the benefits far outweigh some of the risk factors and some of the harms. Now, this is the other thing I have to say, is that there are harms that occur. They occur, in some cases, across international borders. We are going to have to evolve uh, practices and agreements among countries uh, to deal with people who cause harm on the network, either harm to the network or harm to people who use the network. We must work on that, and we have to recognize that that's equally important to keeping the network open and free. Mr. Surf, on behalf of all of the people who use the Internet, and of course we wouldn't be able to do this without your invention, we thank you. Uh, you have changed the world. Well, I got a lot of help. Millions of people have contributed to this. And all I can tell you is that I am glad to have been of service, and I am grateful that so many other people saw this as an opportunity to contribute and have done to make the net what it is today. Uh, Vid Cerf, the uh, Vice President and the Chief Internet Evangelist at Google, google.com slash take action if you wish to take action. I also encourage you to visit EFF.org, another great organization doing its part to fight for freedom on the Internet. Thank you, Mr. Cerf.